I'd like to dedicate episode 10 to one of my main supporters that when I'm debating the amount of time I dedicate to this hobby podcast, as Catherine likes to call it, his messages keep me going. So happy belated June born day to you, Chris Barasa, my brother, the principal, the father, the sparring partner, and one of my co-op lifelines. Since this is episode 10, I want to make it a little special by giving away some game download codes. So stay tuned for instructions on how to enter to win. Now, hit the music. On our landmark 10th episode of Out of Play Area, we feature Danny Buller, a co-founder and design director at Polyart Games here in Seattle, whom I've had the great fortune to work alongside from our start at Midway Austin on Black Side Area 51, onto Rockstar San Diego on the Game of the Year award-winning Red Dead Redemption. And from there, he's gone on to help design the blockbuster franchise at Bungie known as Destiny. He's a dear friend, former roommate, best man, and untamable creative spirit in this industry who goes in on his journey, how to give objective feedback as a design director, knowing when it may be time to leave a powerhouse like Bungie to strike out on your own and co-found your own studio for VR from the ground up. We'll also touch on how music and video games can meld more together, the impact that Seattle has had on him personally, professionally, and spiritually, and the importance of practicing empathy with being a game designer. Derived from Crofton, Maryland, please welcome Danny Bula. Let's start the show. Bienvenido, bienvenue. Welcome to the Out of Play Area podcast, a show by video game devs for game devs, where the guests open up one-on-one -on -one about their journey, their experiences, their views, and their ideas. No ads, no bullshit. Join us as we venture far out of the play area with your host, seasoned game designer, John Diaz. Look at you. You're already deep in, man. Cheers. Toast. Toast to you coming on, bro. Cheers, man. Thanks for having me. So this is a special episode, DB. I couldn't have lined it up any better. This is episode 10 of Out of Play Area. Perfect. And what I found out is that... There's, on average, typical podcasts make it to nine episodes. And then for whatever random reason, they stop, they drop out, something happens. So there was a hump that I had to get over. And with you, I am conquering that sum of a bitch. And yes, making let's it to go. Double digits. I'll reach my hand out and we'll just like get over this hill together. Yeah. And, and then I get to enjoy the ride down. So I'm excited. Bet. We're going to get in there. Cheers. Cheers. It's easy to drink. <laughs> I'm hyped. It's going to be a fun conversation towards the end. <laughs> Happy Friday, man. Made it to the end of the week. How are you holding up in the madness of 2021? Where right now was today? Like March 5th? We're getting close to one year since a majority of us have been working from home. Kind of crazy. Yeah, I think I hit the one year or I'm going to hit the one year. Yeah, it's been a good week. It's been a busy week for sure. But it's been it's been good. I uh, actually just got back from a trip last weekend where I was out in Montana for a snowboarding trip, just to just to stay in the car, drive out there, stay in a cabin, go to the mountain, and it was really beautiful. I hadn't seen Montana before, so taking a drive out there was was really cool. But that means when you go away for a little bit, you come back and there's a lot of stuff nice and warm on your plate waiting for you <laughs> to uh, to attack. So that's pretty much been my week. You know, there's a lot of stuff to do. Not only at, at the company, but at home and just getting back from a trip, all things that come with that. And then also just, you know, having a game to make too. And not only running the company, but or working to run the company, but making games. So there's a lot, a lot going around. Multiple hats, as always. I'm super curious about that, man. How has it been running a studio, building games throughout the work from home and the pandemic? I, I, I look at it from my end and I'm like, man, this is... This is pretty sweet, right? There's some trade-offs for sure. I never thought that the industry would allow any of us to get here. And yet here we are. Yeah, exactly. I think that was like, that was the first thing that, I mean, there's so many changes, right? Going from seeing all your coworkers, I mean, game development is all about collaboration and you're seeing them every day almost to not being in their presence at all. And that's a big thing for collaboration, at least for me, so much of it about is it about physical energy and, you know, harnessing the energy in the room and the creative energy and 
and bouncing ideas off of each other quickly with like and efficiently. It's a little bit more difficult to do when you have to send someone a Zoom invite just to like ask them a quick question, right? Or, yeah. So there is some friction there to game development, but all in all, I agree with you. I think there's a really cool shift that's about to happen if if it's not already happening. But you know, when we come out of all this, what does it look like? We worked at a lot of companies, you and I both were like, and for game development, this is really important. Security is a really big thing, right? And mm. you know, being the intellectual property in house. So there was a lot of, along with the collaboration, there's a lot of resistance sometimes to let people take work home. And that's always sort of been a game industry thing for us, right? There's a lot of people yeah. that can work remote, but we got to have these, these expensive dev machines. We got to be connected to high speed internet. And so it just really wasn't possible until this happened. Usually when you're making policy decisions, it's around risk. So you look at the types of problems that you need to solve currently. And should we go full remote is usually something that doesn't necessarily hit the top of the list in the Not conversation because like, you know, at all. what you have going is working, but this kind of changed that. And so you have a lot, a lot of different conversations. Everybody's at home. We're now seeing that games can be made when you're not all in the studio. There's pros and cons, right? But it's certainly different. It's certainly cool. I love that our industry is getting a little bit of a shakeup from this. We would just have to look at things a little bit differently. Even if we go back to what it used to be, we'll have a lot more knowledge about what it can be or what, what different things look like. So yeah, it's been, it's been super interesting and I've been just figuring it out along with everyone else at the same time. I'm excited, but we'll see where everything ends up. I think overall it'll be a blessing though. Yeah. You guys had just moved into a new building and everything too, at the time, like down in Pioneer Square. Yeah, we were in there for three months after probably looking for a new office because, you know, we were in a place that was meant to house the Moss team. And as we raised our next round and we started moving towards what's next, we needed more space for those teams in the future. And so there was a bunch of challenges and hurdles in finding this space. And then we get in the space, we move in and we have about three months in it before the pandemic hits. So damn, you barely got to get comfortable in there, man. It's a beautiful space, too. Yeah, I love it. The, like one of the things that we all joke about is like... <laughs> Right when the sun was starting to come out, because the clouds were clearing here in Seattle, and we got you know like a great view of the sound to just sort of relax and look at. We were we were out of there before we really got to enjoy that. So I am looking forward to getting back yeah. and just having a space outside of my home that I can be creative in and talk to other creatives and be inspired. So I, I am excited to get back into the office, but I think what we have going on right now is really cool, and I'm excited to see what the evolution of it is when we're when we're back officially in. You know, yeah. most people are back. So it's been crazy, man. Like these forcing functions, right? Like change always comes by necessity, right? It's never like somebody's like, oh, let's change everything up, right? We, it's, yeah. it's like we're always forced to adapt. And there's a lot of shitty things that have come as a result of the pandemic, but Absolutely. we're fortunate enough to be in an industry that has been able to thrive in the pandemic and kind of make it more bearable for people. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? A pandemic was definitely not in our business plan for things that we think we're going to make VR adoption grow quicker. But yo, tell me not though. Did that not like spike up VR adoption? Did you see that? Yeah. When, like when I look at the numbers, it does seem like it's more or less tied. Uh, re the more recent spike is more or less tied to the Quest 2 launch from Oculus. But I think a lot more people when it got released were in a place where that sounded great. So, you know, we could be in a perfect storm where a lot of people are at home a very accessible, yeah, the Quest 2 is a beautiful piece of hardware and it, it's at an affordable price. That barrier of entry is lowered. It's really attractive to people. And I, I love that we have a game on there for those as the market grows and as people start to come into VR that we have something for them to check out. And it's cool to still keep getting new fans and new customers. Again, going back to the blessings, like we are very fortunate to be in this position to be able to have created something and then people still be able to find it and us not be affected in the ways that other people have. But take what you can get amongst this chaos that is the world right now. Yeah, man, adapt, take what you can. Like that's how this show came to be, right? Like I was starved for connecting with the homies, talking about the job, having drinks with people. Yeah, It was a super big forcing function that's kind of panned out. There's a positive side that other people get to share. Mm -hmm. and hang out and listen and hit me up. But really, it's been an excuse for me to force you guys to 
to get in and chat and tell me how, how life's going, man. So. I was just about to say that's its own forcing function in itself, right? Well, we were talking about it. I was like, well, if Diaz will do it, we'll definitely have a conversation, right? And so kudos to you for putting the energy into all of this and creating something already that's like really special. I've already heard from a couple of people that, you know, have loved what they've been hearing. And here, here we are on episode 10. So Boom. amazing. Damn, that, that sounds good when you say it like that. <laughs> uh, I think I think it's super special the fact that you know, we started together graduating full sale back in like oh six. You know, we've been on a hell of a journey. Yeah, man. Like I love when our classes overlap. What what a great way for us to not really know each other, but know each other, right? You know, become classmates and colleagues. I love that. It's easy to look back and see how you ended up where you are because pretty much from the get, from midway, you were always in kind of a managing or leadership role some way somehow i chalk it up to a lot of things right you have a very strong ability to have a vision in your head and intuitively convey that and and that's not a skill that you can teach right you, it's a muscle you kind of work on but you've always had that knack and and i think that's that's led you pretty far yeah i mean did not think that this would be the journey. I don't know if starting a video game company, let alone a virtual reality company, was on my list 15 years ago. Whoa, yeah, it was 15 years. Damn. Time aside, I, you know, it wasn't really something that I had aspirations for. So it's definitely been interesting. Like you said, I can go back and see all the choices that I've made that have got me here. It definitely wasn't something that I set out to. But as I've gotten older, we wouldn't have been able to say this back when we were midway, obviously. But, you know, as you get older, you get more wisdom and you see a lot more things. And I found that it's not so much I wouldn't say like having a clear vision because there's plenty of times where I've said to people, I don't actually know where to go next or I don't know what is the next thing. It's easy for me to hold a vision in my head and like understand it and help hone it in. But I definitely do love other people sort of having something they believe very strongly in and me supporting them and making it a reality. And then in that way, also adding the things that I like about it. But I've come to learn that one of the strengths and things that bring me joy is sort of getting a bunch of people to create something and us creating something together and the collaboration and the sort of creative energy that like circles between all of those people and bounces off and becomes something completely different than from when it started. And then when you think about it, there has to be someone there that's also like making sure, well, it's definitely not this and it's not this. So like, let's keep going in this direction. And I have the ability to sort of understand how to get to somewhere, mm -hmm. but not necessarily always understanding where we're trying to get, if that, if okay. that makes sense. So like a lot of the times for me, I think early on, I had a lot of fun of just like communicating complex ideas to a, many different types of people and sort of meeting them at the person level. I feel like I get to know that person and then I like to find the ways that, that make them happy. What are the ideas that make them happy? And, you know, there's a lot of different things in there, but I'm, I'm sort of honing into the thing. The thing is like, I get joy when other people get joy because then it gets me hyped and then they're hyped. And then all of a sudden we're given a high five and now we've got like a new weapon in the game. And so like, <laughs> you know, like I, I love that back and forth of collaboration into something that we then deliver to the players. And then X number of people get to experience something that was just a couple of people in a room that were jamming that started in their imagination. And now it's like in a computer, right? Yo. So like you go that whole path, it's, it's really rewarding rewarding to me, even though that process of going from the idea to getting it in the computer can uh -huh. be very challenging. And then getting it from the computer into the player's hands is even more challenging. Yeah. But the feeling you get when you do that fuels you to keep doing it, I feel like for me. Heck yeah, for sure. When it's tangible and you can control it, you can play it, you can make decisions based on what's actually going on versus kind of in the theoretical space. Totally. And it just gets better and better or you get some precise feedback to be like oh that that's not what i thought it was right but now we know yeah you got to be really comfortable with saying now we know in game development <laughs> <laughs> the, your, your intuition has always been strong i feel like and i am genuinely curious because i've seen you use all types of tools right i've seen you use all your senses in what you do and, it, and it's awesome and so in the design space there's so many different ways to go about what we do, right? Like some people are super visual, some people are verbose, audible, you know, hey, here's a here's like a 10 page doc, here's a PowerPoint, here's a, a whiteboard thing, right? I'm, I'm curious what you found throughout your journey and doing what we do has been like a, a consistent 
tool set or something you would share with up and coming designers? Yeah, I, like I've definitely been on a journey. I've been at studios where certain type, like you're told how you need to communicate with other people. I've been to places where they don't really care if you communicate at all. There's so many different types of cultures. So I tend to find what is going to be the easiest way to communicate the type of idea I'm doing. And a lot of the times for me, it's not writing. Mm. I was a very much a hands-on tactile learner and, and math came relatively easy. That's why Full Sail was so powerful to me and and sounds like you as well yeah. just the fact that it's very little you know we had theory we had kind of our core classes but spun through a game design lens mm -hmm. but we were hands-on pretty much from beginning to end right like a little bit of lecture but like code math physics you know AI. Yep. Like we'll teach you something for the first four hours of the day. And then your second four hours of the day, you're going to go put it into practice. And then you can go home and play WoW after that, which me and Brasa did. But that was really helpful for me. And the structure, I'm very easily distracted. So mm -hmm. not having a lot of things to distract. We were at school for eight hours a day, five days a week, sometimes six, depending yep. on our schedule. We didn't get summer breaks. We didn't get these little quarterly breaks. But what we did get was like a bachelor's degree or a very good understanding of game development and a strong network in two years. So again, going back to trade-offs, there's pros and cons to that. But I don't know if a traditional college would have been good for me because like I'm not the best studier, but I'm very much hands-on and you know, like collaborating with people and 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 working in groups and stuff. So yeah, full sale is great for that. Yeah, because they do a great job of like forcing us to be into teams and pair up and, and group together. You probably ended up working with people you wouldn't have yeah, necessarily totally. partnered with. Yeah. And, and it prepares you so good for the industry, right? Because I feel like at the design discipline, we tend to be the glue between a lot of creative departments, and we have to figure out a way to bring two ends of the sword together sometimes. That's a good segue back to your original question, which was communication <laughs> and what's a good way to communicate. I started off by talking about what it is in my strength, but I think one of the strengths is I've been using is more like flowchart diagrams. Those are powerful. There's like a web app. I don't know if we call them websites anymore or applications yeah. because they're all one thing now. There's a thing you can visit on your phone or your website or on your computer called Lucidchart. And I think they have an expansion called Lucid Spark. I've been finding Lucid Chart, you know, I don't think it's too different than most flowchart things out there. You can just access it from a lot of places. Has been really helpful for me for breaking out all my ideas onto a place and then connecting them together and then seeing them all in one place. And, you know, we work in a small team. There's not a lot of time to digest a big document. And because we're on a small team, things are moving very fast, sometimes, you know, extremely fast. And so documentation can can go. It can rot very quickly. Yeah, it'll get stale super quick. Yeah. That being said, there's a very important role for documentation in terms of the planning and getting everyone on the same page and stating your goals and your constraints, which we can talk about how I approach that stuff. But I, I really love giving something that, especially when we're all working from home, something they can pull up on their computer, look at it and follow along with the text that I write. Like write thinner, lighter text, but provide visual examples to help them go go along. And that's just my approach. That's powerful. Yeah, there's a lot of people who do it different ways, but there's some things that you do need more thorough detail in. But a lot of times when I'm just trying to like talk about the pacing or the distribution of mechanics across the game, like or like the things that you're asking the player to do within certain areas of the game, et cetera, and systems, boss fights. I think flowcharts are great for that too. Flowcharts aren't great for like level layout. That's not what mm. you would want to use that for. But you know, if you're trying to like pace out beats and communicate that to people, I think flowcharts are a great way to, to do that. And and I personally use Lucidchart for that. I'm glad you touched on that, right? That's a tool that hasn't really come up in most of the conversations I've had already on the show. Hmm. And I love that you call that out because I uh, definitely discovered them when I got into the AI design space. They're super powerful just for all system design, really, right? Like, hey, what comes before what? And then what does that open up into, right? And, you know, you don't have to get bogged down into a wall of text or you can definitely kind of click into the to the bubble or whatnot, and it could link you to a wiki or something like that for more detailed breakdown if needed, right? Yeah. And it just as you were talking about it, it brought something to my mind. It's like, you know, game development is a series of interactions and choices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a lot easier to communicate a choice or a conditional check or like in a flow chart than it is yeah. in, in, in like a bulleted list because you're like, hey, this is what the player does. If they do this, blah, 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 or if they do this. And, you know, like I, when I'm consuming someone else's documentation and they like type out 
if statements in their description or like the different edge cases that can happen inside their walkthrough, I tend to get a little like blurry eyed because it's a lot of text and it's hard to keep it all in my head. But like the cool thing about a flow chart is you just take a left on the flow chart instead of taking a right and you get to see that stuff. So I think there's a lot of power in that. It even makes for a great test plan too, like at that QA level as well, right? Hey, does, does all this resolve in the sequence we expect? Or, okay, now I know to go test the other branch, right? Or, hey, what happens if I don't do either of these? You know, will, will the game catch that? I definitely know from a production process side of things, the more visually you can communicate. I don't know if I'd use flowchart for production as much as I would. They, I lot of see a lot of Gantt charts or Nat charts are just like bars. You can follow the timelines and you can see. But I do think the game development production process in itself is a constantly mutating beast depending on what project you're at and what studio. Even within one studio, multiple projects are going to have their own processes. And so flowcharts are a really good way to communicate things that are happening over time to, you know, as we talk about it more, I, I, one of the things I love about the way we've worked at Polyarch is, you know, you can really just use whatever tool is best for the job. Yeah. And I think that's super important too, as creatives, especially when you're working at a place where there's people that can come from different areas. We've all worked at different studios. When you're on a bigger team, bigger studio, you need to have hard process because it mitigates risk. It keeps everybody on the same page. And that's a skill in itself doing that. And it, and it takes a lot of work to do that. And those are hard problems to solve. Um, when you're on a smaller team, everyone's moving fast. So you really want to be able to communicate things as quickly and lightly as you yeah. can as you're working. And so like people may be doing multiple things. And so when we bring people in, we're very adamant about, hey, let us know the tools that you need to do your job best. And then we will do our best to make sure that you have those because I think that's really important. There's a lot of people that do things differently. Mm -hmm. You really want them to be able to play and work and, and do what makes them comfortable because when you're hiring veterans, who are we to tell them how they should do their work best, right? Yeah, you're hiring them because they're good at what they do. You're not going to prescribe to them, hey, come do it this way. Totally. And we get that benefit because we are, you know, at a smaller, we can be a little bit more nimble, right? And so that's that's not the case for all studios. And there's a lot of reasons to not do it that way. And most people will, but sometimes you need some structure when you have a bigger, bigger studio, bigger team. So you have a lot of experience to draw from working at much bigger studios, working on those like borderline quadruple A games, right? Like Rockstar and Bungie. We're at another A now. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. <laughs> You got to draw a line. When your credits go past 30, 40 minutes, that's got to be another A. I'm with it. <laughs> you went from heavy hitter to heavy hitter. And I felt like you left Bungie kind of at this amazing crossroads where they had just shipped Destiny 1. And you can kind of look back and, and be like, they're doing amazing things. Yeah, they're crushing it right now. Right? They, they kind of figured out that live game in the console space, which is no small it's feet. a big feat man people still are trying to do it and and destiny keeps going they got some smart people driving that ship so to that actually i'm curious how do you know when it's the right time if it's ever a right time to leave kind of the security and, and venture out to do your own thing yeah a lot of the times i think we talk about personal growth you know, growing your skills, growing your sense of self, understanding the type of things that you want to make, understanding how you want to make them, understanding the type of people you want to make experiences for. I mean, I think some of this stuff can just be used even if you're outside of the industry and in just your day-to-day -day life. But I think there's a point where you we worked on Destiny for four years. I was very fortunate. I think they were they were already prototyping it and dreaming up ideas and building the engine and all that stuff by the time I got there. So, But when I did get there, it was still in the transition between... I think when I started out Destiny, we were still you know using abilities and shooting guns against Halo characters, right? Or, sure. or that kind of stuff. Like they were still transitioning and you know that's a really exciting time to be a system designer, or they call it sandbox at Bungie, which is like a gameplay designer and a really exciting time. So exciting that I was nervous. This is a whole other story. But as I was getting into the music scene, one of the things that really helped me was like, hey, nervousness and excitement is the same emotion. You just have to think about it differently. And that really helped me when I was learning to like get in front of a bunch of people and play music. But I think it's the same for when you're making life decisions. And it's never going to be the same thing for any person. We're all so different. We each have our own things that the when is the right time to leave a place? I don't know if anyone will ever have the same answer. Usually people are chasing after the same thing and that is a good reason for them to leave. But I know 
my reason for leaving Bungie is different than uh, Tam, who also worked there and we've started the company and, and from Chris and from a lot of the other people we were fortunate enough to work at Bungie with and they were excited about working on the same type of things that we were and we're looking for the, some of the same things, right? So that's why I was going back to it. It's like, we all don't have the same reasons, but we all might be looking for the same thing. And when you have a lot of other people that are around you that you work well with and that you see similar values in, um, especially from a cultural and how you want to build games, I think that can be a really strong magnet of bringing people together. And so for me and Tam, that was virtual reality. And that was us, Tam and Chris Alderson, who's the other co-founder. We would hang out outside of work, right? We were friends outside of work. Those guys took me along with very talented like uh, environment artists, just artists in general, game developer. Blake Lowe is, is his name. They would take me out snowboarding in Seattle. They were some of my first friends that took me out to the mountain. And so <laughs> it's funny. I just got back from Montana. I didn't know how to snowboard before I met these guys. And now I'm driving out to Montana and snowboarding with other friends and stuff. So you know, you find similarities. You have similar things that you're into, right? And so back to the industry, you know, Tam and I got you know, we were fortunate enough to go check out early virtual reality. We were close to Valve in terms of proximity of our office. People had friends there. I feel like Seattle was definitely ground zero for a lot of the VR pioneering that was happening. Yeah, I think for games and experiences, yeah. And then there was like LA was doing some film and 360 video stuff. Austin has a pretty good 360 film. I mean, the South by Southwest, I've looked at some of those VR films that come out of that shorts and they're, they blew my mind. I wish I could go back and look at more because I bet you they could inspire us on how we make our games because, you know, we're all creators trying to use this new medium in interesting ways. So they're probably exploring things from a different angle than we are. And there's probably a lot to learn there. But yeah, I think that knowing when to leave is like knowing when there's something else that you think will fulfill you or something else that you want. You know, we've worked at Bungie and Rockstar, Midway, rest in peace. You've worked on Montreal, right? And now you're at EA, right? And so like, we've all worked at a lot of these big studios and some of these companies, especially like Bungie and Rockstar are at the top of their game. You will not get to work with more talented people than you will at some of these studios. And, you know, for me, I like to surround myself with talented people that will push back. Yep. Because that's how I get better. I think you were talking about building swords earlier. You're dropping knowledge bombs out there, DB. Like, I love that expression of nervousness and excitement are the same emotion, right? Yeah. And, and if you channel them, if you understand that, you can channel them to produce the same thing, right? Because when you're, when you're hyped up, you're kind of, you know, all pistons are rolling, all pistons are firing. You, you, you're kind of empowered to do some of your best, best work, yeah. best moves, best whatever, right? Just, you know, you're not sweating it. And in nervousness, I think you are a little bit unsure or unaware, but the energy is there. Like the energy is wanting there, to yeah. push out all at once and you don't, you don't know what to do with it, right? So like, that's super powerful, bro. I really like that. I'm going to keep that to heart. And I want the people listening to keep that to heart, right? Whenever they feel that little like butterfly in the stomach, know that it's it's really excitement wanting to fly out of your mouth, right? Yeah. And like, if this helps people back into it, I, I this is how I tested it. I thought about how I felt getting in line for every roller coaster back on the East Coast. <laughs> we got King's Dominion and I'm in line and I'm so nervous, but really, I'm really excited. You know, yeah. it's, like, it's, a, it's a very similar feeling. So yeah, that was very helpful wisdom from uh, one of my friends. Uh, I appreciate it. It makes a lot of sense now, you know, because when I try to put myself in your shoes to venture out alone, it's very different than to venture out with a group of some of your most respected and creative peers that you just like to hang out with in general, right? Yeah. You can kind of go with them in step in the journey to the unknown. Who knows where it's going to go, but you know you got a strong tribe of companions at either side of you that you know have brought out some good work. And it shows it shows today. It's easy to look back today and be like, yo, it was the right call. Yeah, but back then it was trust. It was trust. It was, you know, I look at Tam. We talked about it. I've always been in a position of sort of like leading people or saying, hey, let's go this way. I mean, not even at the industry when we would decide where we we're going to go hang out. Be like, oh, let's go do this. You had a very prominent role in our group, DB. We always called you what? PR? Yeah. <laughs> Whenever there was a situation that involved finessing your way through it or charming your way through it or, or we don't know what to do, you were front and center to help us figure out how to get into the spot. It was basically always how to get into the place. <laughs> it was always that. Yeah, because I'll say, unless it's the cops, no one lets me talk to the <laughs> cops, man. <laughs> now, me, that's what me and Barasa can, can do that part.
when I think about what it was like, and this is all just in my head, I'm drawing myself a little fantasy of you and Tam and Chris running, spearheading to get this studio off the ground. And I picture when we were tearing it up in Austin or tearing it up in SoCal, that you are front and center PR and, and wheeling and dealing and pushing a vision that is not all there, right? And then conveying it to investors and things like this and, and really pushing something, willing something into existence. But that's what I imagine just from what I know of you, right? That's how I picture it. That's a great segue to me going back and talking about Tam. I had not met someone who I thought I could trust as much as I could trust Tam in terms of like with my, you know, creative energy, knowing that we were in the same place. There was a lot of times where, the, you know, Chris and Tam are my friends, like outside of work too. So even yeah. when I was going through personal things, you know, Tam was there and would help me through those and help me find myself even more too. So before it was even a business thing, it was like a personal friendship thing where you could look at this person and say like, you know, this guy is looking out for me. We've only known each other for a couple of years, but he has my best interests. Mm. I can't imagine that by the time we met that he was even thinking that we would start a company together. Right. So like, I, I just have to make sure credit goes to the, you know, he is a powerhouse. Mm. If you think that my energy of communicating an idea or discussing complex ideas or topics or policies or theoretical approaches to certain things in a way that other people can understand it. I think he's amazing at that. And that was one of the reasons why when evaluating the risk of leaving a place like Bungie to start something that I felt so confident in it because I would look at how he saw the world and how he saw the marketplace and how he saw the business and the industry and be able to bounce my own thoughts off of that and see that we were in line and trust that I wasn't just having someone be a yes man, right? Or a yes, mm -hmm. yes woman, or just overly excited to go do something and that I'd be putting my livelihood at risk because I'm following this person. So I actually think he did a really great job when it came to heavy hitting in terms of like, okay. hey, this is like a really complex thing to communicate to people that we think virtual reality is going to be a thing in five years. This was back in, you know what, even even more. Yeah, I'm sure people had no concept, no real clear understanding of what it could be. Today, people kind of understand, oh, yeah, the headset and these types of experiences, right? Like Beat Saber or Moss or mm -hmm. these type of things. But back then, we're taking it for granted, right? That there was no real frame of reference for what it could be. So, yeah, it's a much harder sell. I'm also bad at taking compliments. So <laughs> let, me, let me help myself out in saying that I do think the the back and forth that we had allowed it to come across as something that was very real, you know, mm. and then you bring in Chris's art. Yeah. Right? So if you bring, you bring in my excitement and my energy and my ability to, you know, sort of gather people around an idea and push it forward. And, you know, we can bring other people in, we can bring in the investors, right? Frankly, the thing that got the money was the games that we made, the prototypes that we made. And so okay. we really didn't spend a lot of time trying to convince people about what we were trying to do because we recognized early on that showing them was going to be a lot more impactful. Yep. That's sort of what got us started on like four people in the storage closet of a nonprofit marketing agency <laughs> started making a game about a mouse or multiple mice. It's a confluence of things, mm. but it was really cool not to be the one that had to figure out how to get us in. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. a, that was like a great thing. And you know, if you find someone that can do that for you, and you know that that's a, the thing that you can distribute to other people or like can participate in, um, that I don't know that 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 got me excited. In the off chance that Chris or Tam listen to the show, I like to take the time out and make sure that we can give our mentors or peers or the people that helped us get through due credit, man. So shout out to Tam and Chris. That's awesome, bro. I, I think like. The culmination of what a lot of game designers aspire to is design direction or creative direction. And I'm curious, where do you draw the line there? Or what do you say is the day to day of being a design director? It's great for people that like to do a lot of different things. I think that's the aspect of a designer is you sort of have to look at everything. When we started Polyarch, you know, we were a team of 13 people. There wasn't really a design team to direct. It was more like, hey, we need to bring on other people who are like-minded 
and are excited about the same things. I wasn't really in a mindset of I'm a design director now. I was still in the mindset of I'm a game developer because that's what was like really exciting was like going from being a specific type of game designer, which I had done like a lot of different things. Yeah. Like at Midway, I was doing cinematic scripting. Yep. At Rockstar, I was doing heavy mission scripting and a little bit more cinematic scripting, right? I spent a lot of time with... <laughs> Seamless cutscenes. Yeah, shit. I spent a lot of time with people reviewing my missions cutscenes where they would go through every frame with the arrow key on QuickTime and let me know where there was a pop. I appreciate them for doing that and it made me a lot better of a designer and I have a much better eye. But in the heat of it, that was a lot to tell me for one frame, the character's arm was here and the next it was here. You know, when you're working a lot, that's <laughs> bro, that's a bro. lot to hear. But there's growth there. I learned a lot. You tell me today in this day and age when we're against the gun and we got to ship something, I would let that bug slide. I'd be like, yo, I can live with that. Yep. Triage. But at the rock star level. They can't, and that's why their games are so polished, right? Yeah, I mean, if you've got the resources, you've got the time, and you've got the willing talent, mm -hmm. then all to you. It's just a lot of the times, that last part, the willing talent. They got to want it. Is it really willing, or is it willing so that I can keep my job? And, you know, like, yeah. it, it's, it's on us as leaders to be able to see through that. And sometimes it's better to take care of your people. It's better to say, hey, this can wait till tomorrow. I'm glad you said that, man. Yeah, I think that's important. That's what I look for in my leaders. I want that human empathy or I want to be able to trust them, right? That it's like, hey, when they say, hey, we got to push, I'm with them. Yep. yep. And when they say, hey, we don't, you know, this could wait. I trust them 100%, right? That's what I want out of my leaders. And it sounds like that's what you guys have built over at Polyarch. Yeah, I think one of the things that I try to embrace the most is calling a spade a spade. <laughs> Like, it's really important because trust is the foundation of collaboration, like really vulnerable collaboration. You're going to be vulnerable with each other. You need to have that trust. So I think that's super important to think about that. That brings me to a question that I had is in that role, I imagine a big part of it is, is giving feedback. And, you know, I don't want to say the words judging, but you know, you're helping to refine an experience that someone else creates or a group of other people create. And I found that that's a muscle that, you know, you can never be too strong, right? Like there's some people that are terrible bad at, at giving feedback and there's people that are, are super empathetic and clear and constructive with their feedback, right? And again, there's a whole spectrum to that. So I'm curious, what have you found to be effective ways to give and take feedback? Yeah, that's a very good question. People have written books about it. Have they, man? Yo, I'm, I'm down to buy some. I mean, I don't know if they've written specifically about giving game designer a feedback about their layout on level four. We're starting to grow, but game development books are still low, but it's growing. But that's why I'm putting this podcast together, man. Yeah, let's like, share the knowledge. I think in general, feedback is hard. Communication yeah. is hard, like you're oh, saying. Yeah. So my strategy has been get away from the subjective feedback as quick as possible. So let's use an example like, hey, this isn't good enough. Good enough. What is good enough? Good enough to you is a lot different than good enough to me. If I'm the design director and I say, hey, this isn't good enough, each one of the designers are going to be like, good enough is a different thing. It's not objective. It's not something that we can all point to and then agree yes or no, this is, the, this is it or this isn't it. Mm -hmm. And so our strategy has been, let's get as close to identifying the objective thing that we're trying to do so that we can all objectively say this is or isn't that based off of our experience as veteran game developers. So it's really important. It's so important. As I talk to game designers that are starting to like raise in the company, one of the first things that I talk about is objective versus subjective and trying to get to a consensus on the objective goals. Good enough is a subjective goal, right? High quality is a subjective goal because each person has a different view in their head of mm -hmm. what good enough or quality is. For sure. And like you said, it's really hard to teach. You can't teach it because like quality is different to each person. So my my approach is like working towards getting to the objective stuff. And, and I, I credit Bungie to really helping me think about things from the player's experience. 
right? Really like putting that and, you know, the player's experiences can be an objective thing, especially as you start play testing, right? So when you're designing things, it's less about, I want this, this, and this to happen. It's more about, I want the player to feel excited at this moment, anxious at this moment, and then relaxed yeah. at this moment. And then when you're playtesting and working through things with people, you can ask the playtester, how did you feel? How did that, what was that experience like? Because in the end, you're creating experiences for people. And so what you want to do is get as quick as possible to the objective things that you're trying to achieve. You know, and, and, and the point, if we, if we get into the nitty gritty, let's say we're working on a level, you just unlocked a new weapon. Yeah. You're building out the, the designer that's working on it. It's the start. You equip the weapon, you get the tutorial, whatever you do it. You objectively want them to use that weapon in this room and then feel smart. Like yes. I want them to feel smart using this weapon. And that that is objective, right? That's something that you can say and you can test people on and say like, hey, did you feel smart? And they're like, no, I just ran up and did it. Like that was really obvious. And mm. then you as a designer can be like, okay, like that's not what I was trying to achieve. And sometimes it's hard to do that from the start, understand what you're trying to do. I struggle with that a lot, but sure. I, as I keep working towards things, I eventually get to a place where I know when I'm trying to get the person to experience. And sometimes the, the things that you're trying to get the person to experience will come from a lot of different places, same person, I mean, player, but that is absolutely my strategy. So I think if I'm telling someone that they're not doing it good enough, I'm failing at my job because what can they do that? Like look, Danny comes to them, it's 4 30 p.m. on a Thursday and says, Hey, like that was cool, but I don't think that's good enough. You know, and then and then they, they go home like, what does that even mean? And I'm just I, I'd rather say, like, hey, I don't think you were using the axe in a way that made the player feel smart. And you know, that's a different conversation. Absolutely. I love that you touch on <laughs> the timing, right? Like you can make or break someone's day for sure if it's like the weekend or the beginning <laughs> of the week. You know what I'm saying? Like Monday, yeah, Tuesday, you get the you get shitty feedback. You're like, oh, I can do something about it. Thursday, Friday, you get shitty feedback and you're like pissed off all weekend kind of It thing. messes up your Saturday. Fucks it all up, man. Fucks it all up. As you talk about that, I can't help but go back to when I was playing Moss and – after slicing and dicing the little beetles with Quill, it was a, a game changer when I realized that I can just straight up grab the beetles. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. A, I was like, yo, I'm the smartest person alive. And then B, I was like, yo, I'm a dumbass. Of course I should have been able to do this, right? Like I'm able to kind of pet her and all this thing and pull things in the environment. It was a beautiful experience that's all i can say right yeah there's a beauty there you just like brought up two things that are really interesting and a hard balance as a designer to do which is like how do you balance discoverability versus tutorialization right if we would have like showed you that you could like hey here's this thing you can grab the beetle you can do this thing. it would have robbed me of that discovery, discovery. where i felt like yes. a fucking genius i was like oh no one else knows this but me i don't even think they know about it yeah <laughs> you know that's a wonderful feeling oh man did you know if you hold them long enough right when it clicks there'll be a little pop if you hit them after that it'll deal double damage i think i had the benefit of of one of you guys was next to me and pointed that out i bring it up as a bad thing that i did as a design director <laughs> <laughs> do tell do tell we all about we all about being vulnerable out here yeah yeah shout out to Barasa because like he was totally the one to help me out with that but i was playing through the game at home and you know i've gotten used to the the combat sandbox and i was very excited and i was like oh this is a really cool thing if you learn that you can grab the enemies then as the reader you can have an advantage and then you can prioritize those targets then like if quill is hitting the target that you're choosing you're going to deal more damage and I, that was a great that was a great idea in my head this is the danger of being like hybrid programmer or designer i also knew that it wasn't going to take too much work to do it and so you know i go in i talk to barasa i ask him about it he's like okay to this day i don't know if he did it because it was like danny the boss or danny the like friend gamer i hope it's always the friend gamer because that's my dude but he did it and it worked great and it's in game i doubt any player really really notices it and I actually made it like, you know, like that kind of thing destabilizes the game, right? Even though it's just a value change, you need to be in a place where like as you get closer, because this was like 
three months from ship or something like that, right? And you're making a change to the sandbox, right? You're making a change to something that happens in every room. Again, learning, learning. You learn what you should and shouldn't do. And in the end, there was no problems. It's a cool little layer that's there for people. But that was definitely one of those moments. Me and him joke about it all the time because I'm just like, I was so excited. I came in and I knew he knew how to do it. And I was like, as long as he's excited about the idea, I'm going to do it. And it was super fun. No problems there. But it's like good to like recognize that like when you're in this position, you have Uh, a certain power, even if it's your friend, that you need to really be conscious about the things that you do uh, as you start to go from like someone that's just helping make the game to someone that's guiding the game to completion, you know? Yeah, for sure. I'm glad you brought that up, DB, because it's definitely a thing where you have a lot of power by sheer nature of, of your role, right? And with your words and your feedback, right, you can make or break someone's day who's, who's working hard to contribute for you. And, uh, you know, because ultimately, whether you want to or not, you can have the power of being like a role model or someone that an associate designer, junior designer kind of aspires to like, oh, yeah, I want to be a design director one day. So that's awesome that you recognize that, right? I, I make the joke, <laughs> is it like Thanos with the Infinity Gauntlet, essentially, and what you do, right? Like, do you have the power to snap your fingers and be like, yo, I don't want your feature your way. I want it this way, right? Like make it happen thank god i don't (laughs) i believe that power lasts in peter bolt our cfo i don't know maybe he'd be the best thanos shout out to peter shout out to peter cfo the money guy (laughs) just like great anecdote about peter is like when we first met him really early on not in the game industry chris tam and i met him and um you know he was working in the finance industry amazing at what he does and he really just wanted to make games. He applied at places like Valve, and I think he applied at Bungie. And like you could just see the desire to develop games bleeding out of him, even though he had no idea what he was about to get into. Uh, <laughs> and so I just, I, I like, you know, now he's a really great friend, and we're running a business together. But yeah, shout out to Peter. Shout out to Peter. Hey, man, I fully acknowledge that you, you, you get to grow in your role and your capacity with the team on studio with the projects you're on i'm curious if there's any aspects of the role that you rather trust to other people some interview there with with the homie clint hawking he was yeah. like he was straight up he was like yo my ear sucks i'm not a good judge of game audio and score and music so i have to delegate that and he had to learn what it was to delegate something right because ultimately it's your game you keep it close. So you're like, yo, every little aspect, I got to, it's on me, right? Whether it's, it's banging or not. And that's powerful, right? To For your team as well, to be vulnerable, for you to be vulnerable with your team, to be like, yo, I want you to take care of this. I trust you. You take care of this part. I'm going to take care of this part. I got this. You got that. I think it's a lot of weight and pressure to put on someone to carry all of that. I, I respect the people that sort of want to sign off on everything and be the sole voice. We get some amazing art out of that, right? I can think of a handful of games. Obviously, there's usually hundreds of people behind some of the greatest art. But for me, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to have, you know, we had sort of a little bit of the Holy Trinity when we started the company. There is never any world that I was going to tell Chris. <laughs> this is Chris, art director at Poly. Chris Alderson, our director uh, and one of the other co-founders along with Tam and I, you know, like I'm not going to like critique his art or Tam, I'm not going to critique what he says. And and even people in the studio, like if it's not my discipline, it's not really my place to critique. They're the experts. That's why we hired them. Mm -hmm. It's important that we trust the experts. But as a design director, you are in a position where you get to make a lot of decisions. I think one of the big traps design directors get into including myself including a lot of other people is sort of feeling like they're responsible for making all the decisions but really early on when tam and chris is my other co-founders when we started polyarch we talked about what is the design discipline and the design discipline you know because i'm such a collaborative i really wanted to hear what they wanted out of that because that was what i was going to handle right like what what flavor are we going on I like that. I like that, right? It's like it's like reaching out, like, "Yo, what are your expectations?" Yes. Right. So you can yep. make sure that you're going to deliver on that, right? 
Yeah, and I and I, it was great because it was the thing that I was excited about, and and I think this stays true, and hopefully we can continue to make it true. I think at least at Polyarc, right? Every game company is different, every culture. But the thing that I'm excited about at Polyarc for the design discipline is that hey, it's our job to shepherd the ideas of others and bring that and like you know sort of take the ideas from these the most talented animators and sound designers and artists, right? We're not them. We shouldn't be critiquing those things if we're hiring the right people. They should be at an expert level. This is a benefit of being in a small team again. Like, yeah. there's different things, right? And so I try to trust all of them to do those things. I try not to, like, overstep. And I'm very fortunate because the people that I'm collaborating with at that level, the animation directors and the sound mm. designers, are way better than I would ever be at those things. Right. Like, and, and I love them. They know the industry so well. I've learned some things. In fact, the response I'm going to give you is actually from our animation director, Rick Lico. When I was working at Bungie as a newer guy, he kind of like sat me down and talked to me about this. And it was like probably the most impactful conversation I've had in my career experience, where it was just around the lines of trust us to create the thing that you're trying to create. Don't prescribe what you would like tell us what you're aiming for tell us what your goals are and allow us to do our work and you know a lot of people could see that and hear that and be defensive about it but it just enlightened me it just opened me up i've got this person that has done this for so many years i've got this other thing i may be in a position where design gets to make a decision but i think in the end you want to let the people that know these things better than you create right that's why that's why you're surrounding yourselves with them i'm not trying to dodge the question to be fair because like i think it's i think it's a good thing i want to call out that feeling of being defensive is a choice it's an option that that you select right like hey how does this make me feel how does this impact me is a choice and it takes some a little awareness to recognize that right like things are not always about us right Oh, that's my constant struggle, man. Like I'm a real humble guy, but inside my head, it's really hard not to make everything about yourself, right? Like when someone says something, you're like, what is part of me that's contributing to that? And it's normal for everyone to feel that, but you have to take that beat and think about where the other person is coming from. And if you can't think about that, ask them because that gets everybody on the same page. And that's how you collaborate well, you know? Being vocal enough to ask what the expectations are, but more importantly, to your point, right? That's what collaboration is all about. Exactly. Hey, I know what I want to do. I don't necessarily know what you want. Let's hash it out, right? Help me understand. That's why I used music a lot when we were starting Polyarch that we were like creating a band just because it was the closest analogy that helped me. Because when you're making music, you're in a room, you're playing drums, someone else is playing guitar, the other person's playing piano, someone's singing, rapping, whatever. You're not talking to that person that's playing the other instruments. You're collaborating with them. You're just, you're, you know, you're feeling it. You're doing what they want to do. And there's some trust there that they're going to go to this next chord or this, that. And so I used a lot of band and I was making an album. It works. It works. But I want to go back to sort of the question about, you know, what are the things that I rely on other people for? Because I think it's really important to acknowledge the things that you aren't good at so that everyone knows that like, hey, you're not good at everything. Right. You know, I think I think it's important to recognize the things that you're not that you're not strong at so that, you know, you can be even stronger at the things that you are strong at. And one of those things for me has been for sure, like, well, we're, we've been talking a lot about design direction. I'll just like say at the top of the business side of things. Again, I was it was not aspirational for me to start a company when I was graduating high school or college as it has been for some people. And so a great thing about the people that I chose to start a business with, that is their thing. And they thrive at it. And they're so good at it, like unequivocally good at it. And I'm so fortunate to be next to them while they're doing it, right? And so a lot of the times I will say, I trust you guys, you know, like this is you guys, you got it. Like, I don't have a strong preference. I think you have the best interests of the company and the games in your mind. So do the thing. Let's go. On game development, I'm a, I, I very much am a person who kind of will walk 15 feet, pivot to the left, walk 15 feet, look left, right. Am I interested? Go to the right, walk left, go to the left. You know, I, I, I live like a little bit of a chaotic creative path. 
to find my way to the thing that I'm trying to make. And I'm comfortable in chaos. Like it stresses me out. You're a feeler, man. You're intuitive. You're an intuitive designer or creative, I'll say. Yeah, you keep saying intuition, Diaz. I love it. Like now it's starting to settle in. <laughs> like I, I see what you mean by intuition now. And I think that's a great word. I appreciate that you called it out because I don't know if I ever really used that to describe my game development style. I could be wrong, bro. Let, let me know how you classify it. No, I think I think that's it's spot on. I, I just spent a week being a little bit frustrated of not knowing where I'm going, but trusting in my intuition to get there. And, you know, we're like an hour out from the time we started talking about this. And like, I felt like I got there. So, but that being said, there's a lot of people where they like to know, (laughs) they like to know where we're going. Is that, is that the Barassas of the world? No, I think he's good. It might be cheating because we've lived together for 15 years or like we've been in the same proximity. We're like college roommates and stuff. So he knows where I'm going to go. That also may be because we've been fight, playing fighting games and he's trained me, so he knows what my mindset's like. But I am so thankful that uh, Barasa works with us because he's someone that knows me in a way that no one else does, right? He's watched my growth from being in college to here, and I've watched his. You know, we've both have been on like similar paths but different. But uh, man, what a what a what a blessing it is to have someone that works with you and collaborates with you that knows you more than like maybe even your family does, right? So like, very fortunate in that way. That's powerful. I want you to know that I really admire what you've been able to do in terms of building this company and assembling your Avengers, so to speak, where you're bringing in homies from wherever they are on the map to your company to power you up because you know that they know you well, right? You got you got a lot of the homies with you, man. I think that's a great way to look at it. It's less about, oh, I want my friends to work with me. And it's more like, I know these people will make sure that that I'm doing the right thing and that they will we'll be doing the right thing for the company. Doug was on here, wasn't he? Doug did a show. Doug was my inaugural out of play area podcast episode and it was beautiful right because i kind of hit you guys all up on mass shotgun style like yo guys i'm doing this thing whenever you can dedicate some time i'd love to experiment with you right i don't know what the fuck i'm doing but i'm gonna do it and uh who better than you guys and i should have not even batted an eye i shouldn't even have doubted doug right because doug was just like yeah bro no problem let's do it like day one he was just like yo let's do it tomorrow i'm like holy shit fuck i'm not even ready i i, I don't even got my little logo yet <laughs> I, don't, I don't got my intro i don't got a schedule i love doug love doug shout out to doug burton man if you haven't heard episode one please treat yourself man check that out that guy's awesome so happy like I'll, I'll be frank i didn't think he would move out of texas and then now we're all out here in the northwest man it's a, it's like another one of these blessings we should count because it's great that you know people that we got to be friends with 12 13 years ago we're now able to like be in the same city so it's crazy man like as we've gone around right austin socal norical seattle montreal there's finite number of game development hubs and between you and me, I think we've hit them all. There's something to be said for like Europe and all those other places. Ironically, Maryland is the one that oh yeah is a little bit of a hub that we ever hit. They've had like Bethesda, Day One Studios, big huge games, Sid Meier's out there. Oh shit! Okay, that's just a shout out because I'm from Maryland. But shout out to the hometown. Shout out to Maryland. That's the last stop on the train for someone. I'm with you. I'm with you. There's always kind of this this going and coming around. But you have seemed to have found yourself in Seattle. You even kind of, when we were talking about this, you know, like you kind of spiritually found yourself out here. Yep. I, I see you planting deep roots here, building companies, getting some assets under your belt. Yeah. I'm so happy to see you, bro, because I know starting this company was not easy. You know, you you went without collecting a paycheck for however long, and then finally you could do that, man. So so kudos to you, DB. Thanks, man. Seattle is a special place. Absolutely. I'm sure it's going to go through change, but what I'm starting to learn, and we're coming on, oh, I'm a month away from 10 years here. Woo! Yeah, crazy. Uh, when I'm coming to learn, this place definitely does, like, you know, comes and goes there's a lot of different things that come through here but this place has definitely helped me come into my own because it's a balance of technology and music 
and outdoors and really intellectual conversations. And I don't want to like put too much weight on intellectual because that's a pretty heavy word, but just like people that are thinking about the world in the same way that you are. And like that can that can end up being a bubble in a different way, but we're all connected to the internet. So it's good to like get outside of it. But dude, I used to joke that if you had, sorry, it's kind of funny to me because we're talking about spirit, but it's really important to me. But like, I do think that this place can really heighten your like self-awareness if you're around the right people or if you're on the thing i mean you have to go through a lot of clouds you have to go through a lot of darkness and it's not like darkness but you get into a place where you have to really come into yourself and the pandemic just shot that up right where you really had to just sit with yourself because you couldn't go hang out with a lot of a lot of people were not ready for that man the the facing yourself kind of thing because you couldn't distract from it yeah, I think we're all, and we're all going to be so much better for it that we all had to sit with ourselves for a little bit and think about it. Absolutely. But it's it's definitely hard. A lot of people's lives have changed over the past year. But yeah, like Seattle like I don't even other than the Nirvana album, never mind that my brothers, I don't even know if I knew Nirvana was from Seattle. Let me be let's be real. When I got here, I learned. Yeah, yeah. And so like I, I don't I didn't think I had a good awareness. This is gonna be like a little crazy shout out, but one of the me and Barraza's college roommates, his name was Jay Nobler. Great game programmer, great shout out to J Nob. You know J Nob, right? Yeah. You live with Jay. You live with Jay. I live with Jay. I gotta reach out to that guy, man. We gotta yeah, maybe he's someone that we should get on here. But uh he's a, he's back in Philly, but he was the first person that put Seattle into my mind because I think he was thinking about moving here. At some point, I had no idea it was the hub that it was. Um, I moved up here and it was like, oh my gosh, this is like a hub of game development talent. In fact, I would call Seattle the Hollywood of the game industry in terms of talent level. If I say that Montreal is kind of the game dev hub on the continent, right on this side, I would easily say Seattle's the hub for the states. Yeah, there's a lot of talent in Santa Monica, LA area, right? Like mm-hmm. SoCal, Austin. Great companies there and all that stuff. But there was just this thing about Seattle that made it feel a lot more intimate than the other places. There's you have a you have a crazy interesting mix. And then you know more than me. So please please educate me. But in the little time I've been here, I see this amazing intersection of Microsoft tech then you have a lot of the game studios right that spun off from a lot of microsoft development and then xbox and all that spins up crazy bungie spins up and then the vr scene with oculus and all of that and then amazon comes in and they bring for better or for worse they bring in their perspective on cloud and everything that that has to offer and then facebook and google it's a hub, man. If they weren't all here at first, and we could probably talk for a whole other podcast about the implica- <laughs> yeah. the implications of like the tech scene. But I, I've said this as a matter of fact, but it's anecdotal, and I'm probably joking when I say it in the sense of like it's not real. But like, I do think Seattle has a way of like culture coming first, and the culture will push it out. I'm, we're in a position right now where the you know technology has pushed a little bit of the culture out, and I can feel it. I know other people that work here can feel it. Um, but I do think we're getting into a swing back where culture is about to come right in, you know, as we all work from home and stuff. So I'm, I'm excited about that, but I do think there's a lot of talent up here. I am pleasantly surprised to be around so many like minded people up here. And that's not that it's the right minded people, right? Like, it's not that it's right. It's just, it's just for me. For you. Yeah. For you. Brings out your best energy. I think we were talking about spirit when we started this Mm -hmm. this question. I think one of the best aspects of my spiritual growth that has come from being in Seattle is just strengthening my empathy. And just like circling back to collaboration is, you know, if you can really put yourself in the other person or the player's position, it'll allow you to do your job a lot better. And I think empathy is the place to start with that. Yeah, I think you you hit it on the head, man. Like, uh, that's a that's a trait and a skill that we can definitely grow. I struggle with it myself in my marriage and personal life, right? Like I, I can always be more empathetic, but definitely for our craft, the more empathetic you can be with the players, the better you're going to be at identifying how to make a frictionless experience, right? Yeah. I feel like I need to like share a little bit that was shared with me during my bungee interview. 
Oh, we love interview stories on here. Yeah, it kind of set me forward with making me a better game designer. I was interviewing. I got asked the question. This is from Jason Jones. Like studio head, right? Studio head. The titles change a lot, so I don't, I don't know what it is right now. But suffice to say, he is you know someone that you respect. This is a guy that Halo didn't exist. He got a group of people, took it out of thin air, created it, and all the other games that they've made, which is great, Mythic, all that stuff. He asked me the question of, and I hope I'm not giving away an interview question, Jason, but uh, he asked me the question of, what do you think makes a good game designer? And I gave a boilerplate answer, to be honest. Actually, let me rewind a little bit. In my boilerplate answer, before I did that, I asked him if he would answer it. <laughs> so I was like, what do you think makes a game, great game designer? Flip the question on him. I tried to flip it. I don't even, I like it. That's not even a strategy that I even thought about in my head, but that was my intuition. I guess we're going back to it. Yeah, and so he he shot it back at me. I answered it. It was something about game feel and just something targeted towards the job. And his response was like, well, I think a good game designer is someone that can put themselves in the player's shoes. And that really stuck with me. I'm fortunate to have like a strong sense of empathy. And so that has stayed with me. It's less about what Danny wants as a player and more about what our audience wants and what more about what the experience that I'm trying to create for this person. And I, that has just really stuck with me for a while because separate from making video games, uh, even in our day-to-day -day interactions, even in our marriages, even in our friendships and even in our relationships, it's really important to put yourself when you can in the other person's shoes so that you don't respond from an ego-centered place right like you don't come at it from like oh hey i know you're saying these things about how it made you feel so i'm gonna like be defensive yep because you feel that way back to that choice yeah it, it was really cool for me to be able to like over these years remember him saying that and just continue to apply it it really takes the ego out of it you know which makes objective feedback a lot easier going back to how to give and take feedback i love that you sharing that with us i really appreciate the fact that by nature of our craft, we can really be better humans by the nature of what we do. Uh, I want to go back to your growth creatively. You know, definitely I can see how being in Seattle kind of led you down this path, but you ventured out into the music. And, and I think that's fucking fantastic because you have a great ear. You know, I've seen you create music from scratch. You used to go by the moniker Tone Stark. I love yeah. it. I love it. I managed to hit up a bunch of people before we were interviewing. I'm like, yo, I'm going to bring the homie on. 10th episode. Let me know if you got any questions. And I got a few. I got a few I got to toss at you. You don't have to dwell on them too long. We can go lightning round status right. if, if, if you're cool with that. Yeah, we can do lightning round. All right. So Ben Johnson, he asks. My boy, Ben J. He's like, yeah, I want to know how you got started in music and more importantly, how it affects your approach to game dev. Yeah. So anybody that knows me, I think even though I was in San Diego, I've, music has been a big part of my life. My dad is a composer, arranger, has been, you know, he writes music. In Seattle, I got introduced to house music and it gave me a feeling that I had not really felt before in terms of like the culture around house music is so welcoming and loving and like meet you at who you are. And it's less about what you do. It's more about who you are and what's the presence that and what are you contributing to the to the dance floor or to the space. Um, and I found that very exciting because the music made me feel really good. And I was just super excited about it. I went like Seattle again, going out, like you go out camping here. I went to a camping at some point and some of the friends there, we were out camping, like car camping. And some of the friends there had borderline like MIDI controllers and they were DJing. And, you know, like I, I'm the kind of guy that always wants to plug my iPhone into the aux. Yep. Yeah, so, you are. <laughs> yeah, you are. That it brings me back to Roxanne, your old car. <laughs> Don't touch the music in Roxanne. No, actually, you had privileges. You had. I did privileges. have privileges. I was one of the yeah. ones that got privileges. So there's foresight there. See, some of the best nights of our lives, man, was uh, San Diego driving down to party. Oh my gosh! Yes, on the Zune. <laughs> Yo, I was the only dude that I was like, yo, the Zoom technology, bro. 
Fuck the iPod. It's all about the Zoom. I'm telling y'all. Y'all don't know. <laughs> Damn. I remember that Zoom so well, Diaz. Oh, man. Yo, guys. It was like music subscription before was a thing. And you're waking me up, DB, because that's when I really embraced house music and, and, and that vibe was specifically for our weekends partying like rock stars. And, and, and that's when I got into it, right? Like I, you know, my background has always been like Spanish music and hip hop. So this was a little bit of growth for me and it was awesome to share it with you and Steve and your moms yeah. and the other homies to be like, yo, I don't really know this space, but I'm gonna play it. And I think it has good effects on y'all, man. And this shit, and I love that. Yeah. I would say when we were in San Diego, that was like electronic. Like we were, is like EDM electronic music. We're like, oh, what is this? Right. Cause we're like down there. We're like, oh, is this? And a couple years ago, once I got up here and there's like a really good underground scene, you start to see like, it, it's very similar. It all goes across it. So like, I'm, I'm defining subgenres here. So I digress, but like, uh, school me, man. School yeah, us. yeah. Like it's, you know, there's a certain sound and there's a certain type of person and Seattle's full of it. In fact, like there's like three cities in the country that do it best. I think it's New York, Chicago. Chicago. I want to throw Chicago and Detroit in there because they're like close enough. Chicago and then and I think Seattle has one of the best underground house music scenes that I've ever experienced. In fact, because when I travel away, I look for it. I got to so, get to Chicago, man. I got to check that place. And too. Detroit, too. I went to Chicago a little bit when we were doing Black Site at Midway, but I was under 21 at the time, so I didn't really like see it. Oh, yeah, because Midway HQ yeah, was there. Shout out to Mookie if we can keep giving the shout outs. I don't know if I'll ever hear this, but like, man, I miss that dude. That dude is amazing. Got me started. Shout out to Mookie Wise Broad. Yeah, I think Wise Broad is the right way. So to answer your question, Mr. Ben J. It was very, very eye-opening to see how much the effort and energy that people that throw shows, the people behind the scenes of the DJ, the people that put all the decorations up, the lighting, all of these things that get set up before you get into the club, how close that is to game development. And I got the experience a year and a half ago when I met a couple people just because I was going to DJ shows and stuff that I got to become friends with. And they then invited me to collaborate with them. And so now I'm in this place where I am collaborating with people to create a physical experience relative to a virtual experience. And I would say that it's had a huge impact um, on my game development career because I'm seeing how like the things that we do are so tied to other industries that it's made me want to even tie them even closer. How can we bring the games industry closer to the music industry? Uh, because it's so close. Like we do some really cool stuff out here in Seattle. We, we threw these uh, warehouse parties where you would turn off your cell phone. We called it no signal. And so every set, oh, there was a Saturday night every once every three months or something like that, where we'd run out this like industrial space. We'd bring in like, like high tier artists. And in fact, at one point, me and a couple of friends developed a little VR application. It was super simple where it was like in the HTC Vive tracked area. And we had these, these like LED balloons. They were more plastic. So the LED balls hanging from the ceiling. And then I would use the VR tracking to then project stuff onto the wall relative to where you were like messing with it. And so it was super cool to start bringing in my understanding of 3D technology and Unreal Engine and Unity and like virtual reality and then put it into this place where now it's adjacent to, you know, a DJ show on Saturday night, a warehouse party. And I'm stoked about that. I'm very excited about blending these industries more closer together. I think the game industry needs to have more musical influence, fashion influence, all that stuff. Uh, but that's another whole another topic that we can talk about later. Nah, bro. I, I love it, man. I, I I believe in in that area to push forward and break down those walls, right? We should there's no reason we can't be closer aligned with one another. There's just inspiration there that we should be like excited to get and then we should also be excited to share our inspiration with the other industries too, you know. I love that, man. As you speak about this thing, it makes me kind of salivate for the old days where we can be out there bumping up on each other, enjoying soon. the experience physically soon, soon. But to that point, right, 
the fucking Travis Scott Fortnite concert, man. Like, there's there's a world adjacent to that, you know, for, for the people that can't be there physically to still kind of yeah, it's really close. Feel it, you know what I'm saying? All right, next question. Steve Messenger on Instagram. <laughs> Yo, let's go, Steve. He says, I'd like to know about Soul Searching Sundays. So we talked a lot about spirituality here. We talked a lot about finding yourself going out and partying, things like that, music, games. What do you have to say to Mr. Messenger? I appreciate, Diaz, your professionalism in that question because I know you have a lot to say about Soul Searching Sundays. Love Soul Search of Sundays. (laughs) For those of you that are not aware, after we shipped Red Dead Redemption, so Steve Messenger is a great voice, great name. Bro, he's he's doing what's he doing, man? He's like doing design direction down at Rockstar right now. Yeah, he's killing it. Soul Searching Sundays was an avenue for you, Steve, and I to become even closer friends, I feel like. Amen. I thought it was a great way to take different people from different walks of life and put them into a similar situation. For those that don't really know, you guys would have no context, so I'm going to help you out. Steve Messenger worked on Red Dead with us. So it's me, Diaz, and Steve. And we lived in North Carlsbad, which is like North San Diego County. So after we finished a hard week of work on a Friday, I'd say we'd say, all right, hey, guys, it's been you know one week in a month. We would take our cars, we would rent a hotel down in San Diego, and we would hang out for the weekend and just relax. It was a way to get out of where we were. Yeah, we we would decompress. We would we would air it out, bro. It was decompress weekend, and and it was great. And I think you, I think it's really important to like have these avenues where you're like with the people. Barasa got out there for a few few of those. We did get B out there, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, once or twice. That was great. And, you know, like, I think the importance of Soul Surgeon Sundays was after we left on Friday. So it's very important to note that was a Friday and he's talking about Sunday. (laughs) We were down in San Diego for the weekend. We'd stay for Friday, Saturday night. We would have to drive back up on Sunday. And it was just a little escape, a little vacation away from the, the nine to five. And we would take these Sundays to just sit out in La Jolla, San Diego, which if you've been there, it's one of the most tranquil, peaceful places. And we would find whatever coffee shop slash brunch place slash whatever would post us up as close to an ocean view as we could. And we would just kind of chill there in silence. And get sun. Yeah. Get that delicious vitamin D, bro. We wouldn't even really talk to each other. We'd really just take in for the weekend to get us reset for the week. And, you know, that's some form of meditation, I guess, in a way. So I think it's important to people that have that, but... I like that. I, I remember a lot too. Mumford and Sons was like a prominent <laughs> soundtrack. <laughs> Shout out to Kent Hudson, man. Jack oh my Frank. gosh, you brought up Kent. I was ready to do it later, but here we are. Shout out Kent. I'm sure Kent likes Mumford and Sons. I still do. Next question. Gabriel Marte. My dude. Out of 10 games, who wins Street Fighter Third Strike? Between me and Gabe? Yeah, I would beat him. Is that Dudley? It would be Dudley if we're fighting game. And he probably had Ken. Yeah, I'd, I'd put money down on you. i put money down on you, Dudley. Not now. Not now. Gabe, if you were practicing, I'm fucked. He's playing nah, He's playing real life Street Fighter with his dojo in Yeah, Brooklyn. he is. I saw him when I went out to New York and it was tight. It was cool to catch up with him. Dude, he's doing, he's doing awesome, man. He's killing it, man. There's Jim out there. We all end up where we belong. And uh, he's always hitting me up. He's like, yo, bro, I want to get into narrative design. I want to write and all that. And I'm just like, yo, yeah, that can happen. But keep fighting. Yeah, keep fighting, man. The homie Grant Shank Waller. Grant. How are you doing, Grant? Oh, he's doing good, man. He's he's coming on this show. He's going to fall out of play area soon. I believe it. He got some cool questions. I can ask one of these. And it's like, because you already kind of touched on Rockstar, how it developed your critical eye, how Bungie kind of taught you to be more empathetic to player experience and really kind of hone in on on playtesting. I'm curious about Midway, to be honest. Like, what, what was your takeaway in your Midway days, right? Like, when you first broke in, we shipped our first game in Black Sat Area 51. Wow, that's a great question. I learned a lot of things in my time there. You're so you're so impressionable when you're right out of college. Oh yeah. The first thing, and I don't know if I like recognized this when I was at Midway, but I definitely talk about this with a lot of people that were there now, is that 
there was a lot of very talented game developers there that were probably just budding. I got to work with so many interesting and talented people that I had no idea that would go to do the things that they've done. And I was just around them. Hell yeah. That's a whole nother conversation. But at the same time, that was a big thing. Like Midway created my network. And that's how I would kind of label it, right? Because Black Site, and people probably don't know this. So <laughs> <laughs> we leave that at the bottom of the resume. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. It's at the bottom because that's like our C game, right? It was our first game. We're really excited out of college. And and we learned a lot. I work with, man, there's so many people there that when I see them. But I think what's important to acknowledge about Midway was that we were working on IP, Area 51. People will remember that from the stand-up shooting. But I got such a dose of the game industry in that we had to make that game in six months. <laughs> Basically. I like plus or minus two months. I don't know because at the same time, I just thought that's how these games are made. I was there in in the heart of production, right? You were there before me, but not by far. Like two months, maybe three months. Yeah, I feel like we skipped a key part of production. Like it went from like pre pro to like ship it. (laughs) (laughs) That's what it felt like. But I had no, I, I had no relative basis. We got it in the box, man. I learned a lot of lessons at Midway. Um, there was a lot of experiences that happened there in terms of just like getting yourself like dipped in the liquid that is the game industry, I guess. Oh, yeah. So one of the things that stuck with me the most, and if I have to like think about it now, I know we we called out Mookie earlier, didn't we? I was very fortunate to have Mookie as my handler. I don't really know if he was my manager. Or... It was interesting, yeah, because you walk this fine line between cinematics and design. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and Mookie was like on the cinematic side and the animation yes. side. And I would give credit to him f- for helping me understand how to communicate with people and helping me understand that it's okay to get out of your desk and go talk to the other person. And figure out what you need to do. And so Mookie was all about grabbing me and saying, let's go talk to the animator. The animator was Nick. Nick Carter. Oh, my gosh. You're my yo. dude. This dude animated Golem in Lord of the Rings. And I know he's killing it out in Texas right now. He's chilling. But you have never worked with such a chill animator that was just like, yo, I'm just I'm going to get this animation done, whatever you need. And I'm going to go hang out with my wife and my beautiful daughter. And we're just going to kick it. I might have a beer. I can't wait till the day. The Midway bloodline is fucking ridiculous. Like, it's crazy to look back and be like, yo, that's where we started. That's where we got our foot in the in the door. Because to your point, right? Like, the people that have gone on from there to do the things we're doing now is, is crazy. And you mentioned it. You touched on it, right? Like, you know, we give a lot of credit. Harvey Smith had had a key role to play in me getting in you know for sure oh we could talk about harvey to think about what what i would say about harvey because it's so impactful harvey and kent right harvey smith kent hudson and harvey has gone on to do amazing things not that he didn't start with doing amazing things right what hasn't he done yeah yeah exactly but harvey is you know he really tells people how he feels and he's really himself oh yeah and and we watched him as people that Harvey took a chance on us, right? Like Harvey took us, Harvey and Ken took us out of school and gave us a job, right? Like they said, hey, we think you guys have maybe the potential to like create games. Yo, potential is the key word, man. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Like all we had was our little full sale projects in hand. Yeah. He's he's safe to say you're not going to be great, right? (laughs) He's an honest dude. You got potential. You're not there yet. He, he, would, he would call us green to our faces in meetings. That was literally the thing. When I finished my interview at Midway, I was sitting on the couch, and Harvey said, you did really good. Everyone thinks you're a little green. And I was just like, well, duh. Just came out of duh, but at the same time, yeah. I appreciate that someone says that. I've, Harvey has said some things to me, just like hanging out, that have like impacted my life that I still think about today. A lot of people know Dishonored. Oh, yeah. A lot of people don't know that, that Harvey is behind that, right? Like, you know, there's a big driving force among among a lot of other people. Yeah, and you, you could say he got it from, like, Warren Spector and some of these other guys, right? But the lineage runs deep, right? And he's kind of definitely kept the... But I think the, the candor is Harvey specific. Oh, definitely. And I love that. Definitely. Do you know how good I felt as someone that worked on his team when I knew that he stood up? 
for us at Midway, you know, like when he said, Hey, these, we did the best that we can, right? This was the situation that we were under and elaborated it. Like that's a real leader and he's a brilliant designer. Oh yeah. Look at Dishonored, man. That's like, he brought thief back from the ground. up. I'm sure there's a lot of other people that are involved in it, but he had the drive to do that. Uh, but more and more importantly about Harvey Smith is that he put energy into finding a group of people that were just graduating college. Uh, mm-hmm. like, and by group, I mean like 10 or less. Like there was a lot of us. Yeah, we, we, had, we had the moniker. It was like the talented 10 of 06 or whatnot. It's just, so, you know, like you, you can never give enough appreciation to someone that had that put energy into finding that and then also helped us become better shout out to harvey and kent hudson shout out to harvey smith kent hudson i'll cheers to that bro mm. we are winding down db you and i we go deep we've run we've run a long history we've seen some things <laughs> we've seen some things we can talk forever i really value your time db thank you for coming on to this 10th episode I want to give you an opportunity to plug what you're working on, where people can find anything you're up to, keep in touch with what you're doing. And there's a ritual tradition we have on the show where if you had a good time falling out of play, <laughs> and there's anyone else you'd like to put into the hot seat or seat come on the podcast, please offer them up in sacrifice and I'll reach out to them. I thought about this a little bit today. I thought about what would be a great thing to contribute. We, you and I have a lot of mutual friends, so I didn't want to take someone that we both, you and I know. But I do think there's someone that could give you a different perspective on a different like form of game development or okay. a different aspect of it. I'm super fucking intrigued, man. You got me yeah. all bewildered. <laughs> That's a very good word choice. I think the person that I would choose is Adrian Cho. Oh, shit. Okay, bet. He works in a part of the industry that a lot of us doesn't know, and he's one of the most creative, inspirational people that I know. So I think that would be like a really cool opportunity to talk to someone who like deals with a different part of the industry that we may not be exposed to as much. Hell yeah, man. Is he producer-facing, or he's more like outsource management? I like both, I would say. <laughs> oh, I-, I can never stop gawking at his Instagram and his photography and then even his like art explorations. I'm so glad you mentioned Adrian, man. I know wifey's happy. Wifey would love to have Adrian on the show. <laughs> I'm, I'm credit. Yo, the guy took my wedding pictures, man. He was my wedding photographer. Hell yeah. I, I didn't, I don't know why I didn't see that coming. I'm so glad you mentioned him. All right, brother, before you go, since this is the 10th episode, I want to treat you to something. And this okay. is because you put me on to this rapper when we were in the thick of the crunch f- trying to wrap up Red Dead Redemption 1. Like 10 p.m., 11 p.m. at night, you're like, yo, Diaz, check this shit out. <laughs> yes, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> check this shit out, bro. And you sent me, you sent me random, you sent me Mega Ran's first Mega Man album. And this shit blew my mind because the bars and his rapping was so hot, but at the same time, it was over nostalgic ass 8-bit, 16-bit yep. beats that hit hard. Yeah, hard. Sounded good, and he was killing it, bro. And I was like, yo. And ever since then, I've been a Mega Ram fan or a random fan. Now, yeah, he goes by random now. So I got I got something I want you to listen to. Wow, I'm here, I'm here for it. Let's go. I brought my countdown. I'm going to do three, two, one. Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff. Cabin crew, please take your seats. We are now about to enter the out of play area. Yeah. If you can't reach me, I apologize. Since we out of play, I never compromise. John D and YC know we got the vibe. Make sure you hit that follow when you hit subscribe. Out of play area podcast. Black out of play area podcast. Black out of play area Yo, Diaz, 
You're blowing my mind right now, man. Are you serious? That's all random, man. I, I got to collaborate with him a little bit. You got this dude to do your intro. Yo, yo, credit to you, man. You put me on to him. It wasn't for you back in the crunch. And I don't know if I would have found him, man. Ben Johnson, too. We went out to some shows. Yo, that was fire. You liked it, man? You got scissor kick in there. Brass <laughs> is going to be hyped. That's a, that's a work in progress. We still got some some massaging and fine tuning. It's it's one of those things you can keep fucking finagling. I think it's perfect. You think it's perfect? Ship that shit. Ship it, I. Right. Diaz, that's amazing. Can we play it one more time? You want to play it one more time? I. Right. One more time. One more time. I'm gonna I'm gonna let wifey hear it. Yeah, let her hear it. You gotta do the countdown again, though. Five, four, three, two, one. Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff. Cabin crew, please take your seats. We are now about to enter the out of play area. Yeah. If you can't reach me, I apologize. Since we out of play, I never compromise. John D and YC know we got the vibe. Make sure you hit that follow when you hit subscribe. Out of play area podcast. Out of play. Out of play area podcast. We got Yo, that shit is fire. <laughs> Yo. Oh, yeah, that man. could not be any better than what it is. I can't, like I don't know what would make that better. I'm glad see that's what we need in this development space, right? We need the person to come in and pull us away and tell us, "Yo, stop fucking with it. It's done. Ship it. Move on." That shit's fire. I'm so happy for you, dude. That is so good. You're the first one to hear it. All right, man. We did everything we said we would do for this fucking show, DB. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure, man. I love you, brother. Episode you 10 is wrapped up. We got Adrian Cho coming. He's going to fall out. And till the next time, friend, I can't I can't wait to see what's going to ship next out of Polyarch. Yeah, I think we'll have a lot to talk about soon. All right. All right. Peace. Bye, y'all. Thank you so much for having me, Diaz. This is... Such a pleasure. I'm glad you're doing it. What an amazing thing. Thank you, brother. How about that for some design direction? There were many gems to take away on this one, from the power of empathy in player-facing design to how to learn to move away from subjective feedback to give more objective feedback. That's clear to anyone. When you break it down to what emotion is it that we want a player to experience? it becomes much more clearer, true or false, right? Like, did you evoke this emotion or not? If not, go back to the drawing board. Imagine how many creative arguments that would save. I know, I know it's not a one size fits all blanket, but it's some of the best advice I've heard on this show. And I'm 10 episodes in. I love saying that, forgive me. I had to count how many name drops we did on this episode. Our networks have a lot of overlap since we worked together at Midway and Rockstar and now live together here in Seattle. He's connected with so many people here. I look forward to the day I can return the favor next time we're in Montreal together. Who knows? Maybe Polyarch expands up there someday. I'll confess, I did leave a lot out on the editing floor. There's more that I left in than I normally would have. And... That's just more of a keepsake for me on this commemorative episode with a great friend, respected peer, and a man whom I entrusted my ring with at my wedding on February 2nd in Seattle. 
How many of you have VR headsets? And out of those, how many of you have played Moss? How many times? I'm ready for them to announce what they've been working on. I don't think this is the last time you hear from Danny on this podcast. As we were talking about electronic music and house and dancing, it just has me itching to get back out there in the scene and let the rhythm move. I feel older, as if my joints and bones have gotten stiffer since I don't move them like I used to. I need to remedy that and see when the next no signal pops up. Put me in a bubble and I'm down. On the 11th episode of Out of Play Area, we'll talk shop with fellow Full Sail alumni and Hall of Famer Grant Shankwaller, who's put off the hat trick in game development, from doing programming to design, and then being a producer across lots of different teams and projects. Now he's living the dream as a game dev consultant. We'll talk about how he found that game dev was his thing, how he broke in, how he pivoted through all those different roles, and ultimately on his journey to finding his calling as a freelancer. That episode drops Monday, June 21st. If you're already following, please take a moment and share this episode with your friends. The more people we can reach, the bigger we can grow this community, the more impact we can have one listener at a time. We made it, y'all. Episode 10 is done and wrapped up. Thank you to everyone who's been sticking with us, recommending the shows to their friends and fellow developers, putting me in touch with potential guests and recommending people that I should connect with and to all the messages I get with feedback and ways to improve and keep going. I hear you. I'm listening. And I hope you see or hear the fruits of your efforts. What do you guys think about that Mega Ran track? I want to give a big shout out to Raheem Jarbo. That man was a delight to work with and his manager, Jeff, for being flexible, easy to work with and working with me till we were all happy. I originally planned to play this song at the beginning of future episodes, but everyone tells me how attached they are to hearing Catherine intro the show, so I guess my only alternative is to keep it as an outro song. I'm open to any ideas y'all may have on how to best use this and fit it in, so make sure to message me what you think. If you've made it this far in the episode, then I want to reward you. I have a download code on whatever console of your choice or PC from a list of current games. I particularly like the last two games I picked up, It Takes Two and Mass Effect Legendary Edition. I've actually never played any of the Mass Effects, so I'm looking forward to finally getting in this world and playing as Commander Shepard. To enter to win, all you got to do is head over to our website, outofplayarea.com, and hit either the email or call button and leave me a voice message on what you enjoyed about this episode, which one is your favorite out of the 10 we've got so far, what we should do more of or what we can do less of, and what I'll do then is I'll assign each email or voicemail number and throw it into my random number generator, and the one it picks, I'll connect with and send the code. Out of Play Area releases new episodes every other Monday on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all the major players. Please make sure to follow us so you see what developer falls out of play area next time. I'm your host, John Diaz. Till next time, Dev, stay strong, stay true, stay dangerous. We out!